G'day and welcome to the first ever Josh Wade show. My name's Josh Wade. Uh, we're rebranding. This is a whole new thing. It's the exact same show, same conversations. We're just getting rid of the conspiracy brand uh, now rather than later uh, because I just feel like it disqualifies some of the really important conversations that we're having. So if I just broaden it out, just change the name to my show, then uh, I guess, you know, we're going to be allowed to get bigger and better guests and uh, oh, I can't say better guests. <laughs> We've, we've had good guests. Uh, you know what I mean. So I'm just going to fucking shoot it in the head uh, now uh, because we have had a few, you know, we've been trying to get some politicians and stuff like that. And as soon as you even mention the word conspiracy, they get scared. So fuck that. Fine. We'll talk about real shit, which we are anyway. Uh, but we're just not going to disqualify the conversation because of a silly fucking title of a show. So it's now the Josh Wade show and you can deal with it. And so can fucking I. And we can forget this all ever happened. And... Connor, I'm stressing the fuck out, <laughs> all right? Uh, today's episode is with Shane Moss. Shane is a US comedian. Uh, really fucking crazy conversation uh, about psychedelics, his experience with them. He is an extremely smart, intriguing man. Uh, we had a great conversation. If you're interested in mushrooms, psychedelics of any sort, LSD, um, DMT, all of that, Shane really goes deep into that. He's touring Australia right now with his show. If you are in Sydney or Melbourne, uh, right now, go and check it out. It's a great show. Uh, but until then, enjoy the show. If you want to help us out on iTunes, give us a rating. It does help. Leave a review. It really, really does help. We do appreciate it. Uh, or listen over on iTunes or on Android. The links will be down below. If you want to help us out on Patreon, we do a weekly live stream uh, in a private group. Uh, there's a bunch of really good cunts in there. We love talking shit all the time. So uh, join us over there. Uh, you know, we do all different types of, you know, advice stuff, whatever. It's a really good group. So, uh, help us out. All you need to do is, is give us three bucks a month and, uh, that'll help us pay for our flights and stuff like that. So we do really appreciate that. Uh, what else, Connor? That's it. That's it. There's going to be new merch on the store soon. Also, here you go. Before we get into this, we are launching. Oh no, we're not. We named, we we renamed the show. All right, I'm going to have to come up with it next week. Fuck it. Enjoy the episode. <laughs> G'day and welcome to the Josh Wade Show. My name's Josh Wade and yeah, this is my show. Uh, my guest on today's episode is Shane Moss. How are you going, mate? I'm wonderful. Good. You've Thanks just flown in from the US. Yeah. yeah just got flight. in today. From yeah. Portland. Yeah. How long is that flight? Or well, what? it's like a couple hours from Portland to LA, then a layover, then a 16-hour flight to Melbourne. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, uh, how, how are you feeling now? Bit. Uh, I'm all right. Yeah. I'm all right. I'll feel better tomorrow. <laughs> okay, good. Well, I'm glad yeah. that you came on now. Yeah. Now, I guess we want to call this episode the psychedelic episode. We sure. We have not done one. Uh, I know a lot of our viewers, a lot of the people, guests that we've had on the show, they love it. Uh, and I guess you're an expert on it. You're doing a show here <laughs> in Melbourne and Sydney. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I have a show about psychedelics and I do a fair amount of psychedelics. <laughs> I don't know how much of an expert I am. I probably should be more of an expert for as many as I do. Well, I mean, you know, you've got to do it to know it, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. So I guess let's let's sort of go into where when when did you first try psychedelics or where when did you first endeavor into the world of drugs in general? <laughs> uh, when I was sixteen. Yeah. So yeah, it would have been like twenty one years ago. Yeah. I was just uh, I, you know I was a teenager, angsty about my uh, life and yep. upbringing and wanted wanted something more out of life and wanted an escape and was looking to get my hands on anything and I'm, I'm I got really lucky to, that I got my hands on mushrooms because that was where you started I started with weed okay. and then I Jeez. had I had a little bit of alcohol <laughs> yeah uh, but I'd never liked alcohol but right. mushrooms was really soon after weed right and I loved mushrooms they were right. just my favorite thing in the world immediately so would you say you were 16 when you first tried mushrooms yeah okay Geez, that's pretty young. I mean, that's that's a you're straight out the gate there. Yeah. Um, yep. So, um, <laughs> it, would you say that's your drug of choice? Do you think that's where you fall? Mushrooms, most? probably. They're the yep. ones that have done the most kind of uh, had the most positive benefit in my life. I take mushrooms and actually learn things about my life that help me. Whereas DMT is my other favorite drug, but yep. DMT is just such a uh, head fuck that it's I I don't. I never know exactly what I'm getting out of DMT other than it's just like, what the hell was that? Yeah, I yeah. don't, it, it, yeah, I mean, it's just a trip to another dimension. Mm. 
So I guess were you growing up? I mean, what, what sort of background do you come from? Are you you know just a middle class family? Is oh it yeah, quite simple? I, I had a very straight laced, very yeah. uh, uh, conservative, religious right. uh, upbringing, and yeah. I didn't fit into it in any way. Yeah. I rebelled against everything I possibly could. And, yeah. And uh, I had a very, uh, I had very strict parents, and right. that didn't work out for them no. <laughs> at all. Do you feel like that's? Do you feel like that's where the rebellion came from? Almost is. Yeah, a little yeah. bit. I mean, I never. It was very. Uh, or are you born with small, that? Do you I, feel. I think I was born with a little bit of it. I remember when I was very, very early, very, very young, like four or five years old, being like liking pressing buttons. I'm from a small town in Wisconsin. Yeah. And so if you're from Wisconsin, you like need to be a Packers fan. Yeah. And I remember at the age of five, like rooting for whatever team was playing the Packers, yeah, just yeah. to like get under the skin of all yeah. my relatives. Yeah. And just because it would cause such a insane reaction from them. And I just, uh, I just loved pushing buttons and exploring those boundaries from a very early age. Right. I suppose that probably feeds into comedy then as well. Cause yeah, when a you're little on stage, bit. do you, with your comedy, do you like to see how far you can? I, take I or? used to really, I, I mean, yes, but that that's kind of changed for me as my career has gone on. Yeah. Because when I started, I was kind of like a short joke, one-liner, absurdist comedian. Yeah. I did like late-night television and stuff, and I'd I'd see like what what edgy jokes I could get away with or whatever. Yeah. And uh, over time, that got I just got I got really good at kind of delivering shock value kind of mm -hmm. concepts and in, in like this. Uh, naive, wholesome way that really allowed me to get away with it. And I kind of got bored with that. And yeah. so then I started doing more informative shows and just kind of uh, exploring the mind a little bit more yeah. on stage yeah. and doing themed shows. Mm -hmm. So I did a show about mating behavior, mm -hmm. um, which was a lot of like evolutionary psychology and biology. Mm -hmm. And then I did a show um, about... Uh, why we evolved negative emotions. It was all about, I, I had an incident where I broke both my feet while hiking. And so I made like a whole show about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then this is like my third kind of themed show that I've, that I've put together. So for me now, pushing those boundaries is like, oh, I want to see how, um, how smart of a show that I can do um, without turning it into like a lecture. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So you're yeah. pushing your boundaries, pushing the boundaries in a different way for yourself. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. I've always like, whatever I've felt uncomfortable doing, like early on, I was like a very, uh, short joke, like monotone kind of almost like Stephen Wright or yeah. something yeah. kind of delivery. And then I started, um, doing a couple characters on stage cause that made me uncomfortable to do. Yeah. Um, I, like if something like singing or dancing or something makes me really uncomfortable, I'll work a little bit of that into my act. Yeah. So always trying to kind of push towards yeah. whatever's making me uncomfortable. Yeah. Not, not so much early on. It was like, Ooh, how can I make the audience I, uncomfortable? Yeah. Yeah. And now it's like, how can I make myself uncomfortable? Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. So, you know, we, do you find, did you find that you were an inquisitive child or was it the mushrooms at 16 that, change that or uh, that's a really good question i i think that um i think that i was naturally uh just um very um oh man jet lag why, why can't i why can't i think I, I was like a bit of a contrarian always yeah. Yeah. and so because i was raised religious i was always just like it, like I converted it, from a very early age, I converted to the religion of uh, what now, and then right. <laughs> and okay, then eventually yeah. like yeah. no, yeah, yeah, you know? <laughs> and, then, and so as I aged, I kind of uh, I basically my my uh, me disagreeing with the belief system that was kind of imposed on me by right. my upbringing was what led me to learn more about evolution and right. science and physics and that yeah. sort of thing. And then mushrooms definitely helped. When, yeah. when I was 16, I started doing mushrooms. That definitely 
got me thinking a lot more about the mind and yep. and science and physics and right. uh, for sure. So I, I want to go into like the those experiences in a moment, but I also wanted to ask if you found you know obviously you, you broke out of this religious sort of uh, belief system. Do you feel like uh, the same thing took place with you uh, in terms of I suppose with politics and and the way that uh, the world is is run and controlled? Like were you sort of did you have a sort of a moment there as well where you went oh this this you know secular and and religious you know yeah i mean i've pretty much always thought everything was kind of bullshit my okay, whole good. life right. and really never bought we're gonna get along <laughs> <laughs> i kind of never really bought into much of any of the yep. um standard narrative yep. the, like uh, the kind of conditioning early on of like standing up and saying the pledge of allegiance yeah. and, and uh, see for an australian that like the pledge of allegiance the, the nationalism that's in that we don't necessarily have that much here really? when you, i think yeah like to me that seems like some north korean shit like that's like whoa like we would never have a, a photo of the prime minister up in a in a classroom i mean the for me personally and i think for most people the flag was never drummed into us as you know, a f- oh, the flag was man. a symbol. In America, it's ridiculous. I, I know. I've seen hundreds of flags in one field. I'm like, just one is fine. <laughs> like, there <laughs> yeah. doesn't need to be any more. It's a flag. Um, but so, obviously, like I said, you were very inquisitive growing up. Yeah. Can you take me back to that first? Well, actually, let's let's go back to the first time you smoked weed, and then sure. we'll get into the real heavy shit from there. Sure, sure. sure. So the first time you smoked <laughs> weed, what was that situation? Was it? <laughs> cliche I, I was i was well the very first time i smoked weed isn't much to talk about because mm. i didn't get high from it um but this happens to heaps of people right? yeah, yeah but the first time i got high <laughs> i was i was with this uh friend of mine who's still a very good friend of mine uh we went he took me to uh, we went and smoked weed in the driveway of like my sixth grade math teacher's house for some reason, just because he thought that would be funny. Yeah. And then we finished smoking and we went up and like knocked on his door and which I thought was odd, but my yeah. friend, I guess, does this all the time. Yeah. Like he was just this old math teacher that yeah. my friend liked messing with. Yeah. And so we knocked on his door and, and this guy, Mr. Ball, comes out. And he was uh, he was talking with my friend, um, and I remember feeling a little funny, yeah. and feeling like something was coming on, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Oh, so you weren't fully stoned yet. You've smoked it, and then you've gone to the door, and it hasn't even. Yeah, okay. And I was, right. I'm talking, and now I'm starting to feel really weird. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know if I should be here yeah. talking with this 80 year old man or yeah, whatever. Yeah, and. Um, and then my friend, it, Mr. Ball, says to my friend, he's like, oh, last time you were here, my friend had all these nicknames for all of us, but Mr. Ball's like, last time you were here, you are with, uh, oh, what's his name, Scott? Or and my friend's like, oh, Skitterscom? And Mr. Ball goes, oh, yeah, yeah, Skitterscom, Skitterscom. And then I remember it was that moment when I like heard this 80-year-old man say Skitterscom, uh, <laughs> that I just lost my shit and yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is what being high is like. Yeah. And then I laughed for about six hours. <laughs> we had to leave shortly after that. I remember we got in my friend's van and he drove us to uh, my other friend's house. And my friend was like, you just got to stop laughing until we get into my bedroom and then we'll be chill. But I couldn't do that. Yeah, that would have made it worse. Our cover. Yeah. yeah. Right, so I mean, for me, I don't know about you, but I remember that first time having that that same experience where I, for me, I was like, "We, this is my thing." I, I loved it. I I don't really like alcohol. I do drink it if if I'm in a social situation that sort of is there's a peer pressure to do it, uh, but weed was just as soon as i smoked it i went this is yeah I me too it's my heroin it's that where that's that nice comfy feeling but i mean it, it also caused a lot of paranoia and you know i think it did have some sort of maybe that was already in my head already that maybe it flicked the switch on but um but okay so you've smoked weed yeah that for a bit when I, did that go from smoking a couple of joints to 
Oh, Let's really? Let's do mushrooms. Well, I mean, it's right like, away. That's right? a fast leap. Yeah, I, I mean, I loved weed right away. Yeah. And I started, I went from like a weekend warrior to a daily doser really quickly. And I think... I think probably within two months, um, since the first time I smoked weed, I, I did mushrooms. I mean, I just remember when I, when I started altering my, my mind with weed and mushrooms, it was just like such a relief because I always felt like the world was such a crazy place and it's always confusing. And I never, and it, I always like everyone else just seemed to kind of be buying into how life worked and yeah. like going along with the, yeah. like, well, you work hard in school and you study and you do all this and you worship the flag and whatever else. Yeah. And I never got it. And so I remember what I used to do for fun when I was like 15 years old. I used to like go to the mall just to like cause trouble just to run around and, and like uh, jump around people. It's just like stupid. Like I was just so bored. That, that just like running around and like yelling at people and like smarting off to people yeah. was like what I did for fun. And I remember when I, um, after I smoked weed for the first time and especially after mushrooms, I was like, well, I guess I don't have to go to the mall anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, finally I found something I that I enjoy. sit in my room for five years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and, and mushrooms for me early on were, uh, I mean, they were just goofy and uh I, I mean i always i was always like really reserved and i always felt like i thought differently than a lot of people mm. did and um and so so weed was the thing that that initially kind of allowed me to be uh, it, it's like okay to be weird when you're high yeah 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 and yeah. and that was such a relief for me just yeah. the just the permission to be weird yeah, yeah. that you get from weed or mushrooms yeah. was it was really a lot i suppose for for a lot of people and and even myself like i've i've always been tempted into you know mushrooms and and psychedelics but the thing that's constantly held me back is you know it's that propaganda i guess that's constantly drilled as your head you're obviously a, a staunch believer in that you know it's nothing to be afraid of um or or is there well with psychedelics well i mean uh i i think that they can go a little overboard i had an incident recently where i ended up basically tripping for about three weeks and had to go to a psych ward for about a week to be stabilized so Definitely, there are. When, there when are you say stabilized, go wrong. when you say stabilized, what do you like? Do they just pump you up with a bunch of pharmaceutical drugs and? Yeah, drink? yeah. Basically, they it, like I was kind of forced to go there against my will because I wasn't yeah. sleeping. I didn't sleep for like three weeks. It was a after uh, I had done mushrooms for. Now <laughs> this podcast just got yeah. really dark. Yeah, all yeah. Of no, sudden. that's this is what we're talking <laughs> about. This is that's the point. Well, I mean, nothing, nothing had ever gone wrong with me um, in terms of psychedelics. They had yeah. always, in my 20 years of yeah. doing them, 21 years of doing them, yeah. they had always been like a really positive, had a therapeutic benefit and everything. Yeah. And, um, and I started making a documentary about psychedelics. Mm -hmm. And so we were trying to, because it's lower budget and we had a pretty short amount of time to film it in yeah. I was doing more psychedelics than normal mm -hmm. and higher doses than normal and wasn't spacing them out and I mean I've been doing psychedelics for long enough now to know what uh, like how long you should give things to integrate and everything yeah. and I kind of wasn't following my own rules yeah and was a little got a little arrogant about it yeah and um I had been doing mushrooms pretty steadily for about three months um, and that was going really well. And then I, uh, like, I'm, I'm bipolar. I yeah. always have been, but, uh, always before, before this. Oh yeah. Yep. But, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Before psychedelics and everything. Before weed, before all of it. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Since I was like nine or 10 years yep. old pretty yep. easily. 
And, uh, and so I, but I stumbled on mushroom. Yep. So I'm bipolar two, which is a milder version. I understand. And so that means you're depressed, depressed. most of the time yep. and not manic that, yep. that often, but once in a while manic. Yeah. Um, and when you say manic, what, so what does that, what does that entail for you then? Manic is what I, <laughs> manic right is what now. I live yeah. for. No, I mean, I wish I was manic right now. When when I'm manic, um, I don't need to sleep. I have this extra gear going. I have yeah. I have this um, unlimited amount of energy. Yeah. My brain is firing uh, so quickly. I'm I'm like an absolute genius, or at least think that I am. Yeah. During those times, and uh, I usually one manic episode. I write enough material for like a year uh, to pay my bills for like a year, yeah. and that's usually like in a week or two. Right, I'll do that. And so you're so, just sitting around going, just come on, like let's. let's yeah, 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 yeah. Always know. just waiting yeah. for those manic episodes. The rest of the time, I'm I'm like either normal or depressed. So do you take uh, during your manic episodes? Do you take psychedelics during that, or are you only taking them during those moments where you're depressed or just sort of feeling not when's the best time do you find to take i find the best time to do psychedelics is when i'm in a transitional period of my life Mm -hmm. when i'm like maybe a little bit depressed and a little bit uncertain of of uh where i'm going with things Mm -hmm. like um so right now for instance this show that i'm doing i did a 111 city tour with it in the u.s Mm -hmm. and i'm i'm out here to do it but i'm i this tour is it ended in june in the u.s i'm still doing it here and there just a little bit yeah but um i'm kind of moving on to the next show and i have like three or four different shows that i'm kind of working on Mm -hmm. and as well as some other projects and i'm not sure what is worth putting my time into right now Mm -hmm. all of them seem like pretty good ideas but i don't know what's going to catch on yeah so this is like kind of my history of psychedelic use is this would be like an ideal time to do mushrooms because mushrooms kind of shows me the direction and clears that path for me right. to move forward. So you, and and uh, so, so that's when I use, yep. that's usually when I use mushrooms. Okay. Uh, for people that don't know then, okay, let's say you've taken the mushroom right now, run us through, uh, as best as you can, run us through that journey. What are you feeling what's going on and when do you notice the change in yourself Yeah. and what is it that makes you go back? Even after, you know, you had, you had an episode where you were awake for three weeks. Like it was, if you stand back out of that, that's, you know, and, and look at it from afar, that's fucking insane. It, yeah, that's insane. It, so it what is. is so good about it that makes you go, I'm still going to continue to do it despite that risk. Well, first off, I haven't done psychedelics okay, since, since that episode. But will you? But I will. Yeah, okay. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, so when I do mushrooms, first off, uh, within about 45 minutes, I start feeling a little something. That's usually just the body's reaction to eating yeah. poison, which is like nausea, anxiety, a little in the adrenaline and... And uh, that first like half hour or so is like an unsettled kind of uncomfortable feeling. It's not right. the best feeling in the world. Yeah. And then within another 30 minutes or so, I would say that, um, that I'm now like starting to trip. And I would, I would say that uh, some of the things that I would first notice is that my vision um, really improves. I notice differences in colors quite a bit more. Mm-hmm. So, if I'm outside looking at nature, for example, um, it's it's like everything is in high definition. It, it's mm-hmm. just like it fl- it flipped into a much higher definition than it normally is. Is it like crisp and and it, sharp and very much so? Yeah, yeah. I mean. At night, you can get some visual hallucinations yeah. here and there. Or if I'm like sitting with my eyes closed and meditating, I yeah. can kind of go into some deeper sort of inner worlds. Yeah. But um, but then I just start. Um, I would say it's like a very deep kind of meditative state where, uh, it, you know how, um, you know how you'll be like working really hard on on. Uh, 
a certain project mm-hmm. and getting frustrated with it. And then one day you're not thinking about it. You're in the shower or something Just, or yeah. It, comes. yeah. yeah. And it, and the perfect solution comes to you. Yeah. I feel like that's what mushrooms does for like four to six hours. It's like that, that little moment of an epiphany that you have when you're in the shower or washing dishes or yeah. in your car you'll have rather than one of those once in a great while during a six hour yeah. mushroom trip, you'll have maybe like a hundred of those. So you're having a six hour fucking epiphany trip. <laughs> yeah. That is great. Yeah. It's yeah. better than an orgasm. Uh, yeah, exactly. Mm. It is. It's way better than an orgasm. Yeah. In fact, I've never had sex on psychedelics. I've always meant to, but every time that I've We'll gone sort it out to, for you, mate. We'll sort it out for you. <laughs> <laughs> every time that I've thought that too, I've I've always worried that it's going to ruin sex for me because I always just like when I'm on mushrooms I just kind of see see us as the primates that we are. So yeah. I don't I don't wanna I don't want to be reminded that I'm having sex with a monkey. (laughs) Could it be, could it make sex better? Or do you think there's also the chance that it could make sex? I think it could ruin it. I think I could get in my head from it and see, I mean, sex is such a ridiculous thing. And I sometimes get my head, (laughs) get in my head about that anyway, about like, I mean, if you see an animal having sex, you're like, look at that ridiculous (laughs) act, but we don't, you know, if you step outside yourself, it seems just as ridiculous. But, yeah, yeah. but when you're in the act and you got the hormones and everything else and the passion going, you forget you how do. silly it is. Yeah. And I worry that having sex on psychedelics, I, I would be very much reminded of how, how sure. silly it is. Sure. Um, all right. So you, you're feeling that feeling you see in high definition um, from there, whether you're in a meditative state or you're not. Is that it just for the next six hours and then you come down or like does it progress to another level or if you do a lot of mushrooms you can see weird worlds um, kind of go into of that a little head. bit more because that people want to know that's that's the juicy shit that people want to know about. well what are these worlds you're talking about that I can't see <laughs> <laughs> well DMT might be an easier one to talk about yeah. because DMT okay. is DMT is a surefire way to yeah. see these other worlds yeah so, um, so I'll just share the first time that I smoked DMT yep, and it. then, and then we can get go into from it from there. But I went to this guy's house and he is like, here's this bong. You're going to want to have three of the biggest hits that you possibly can. And the first one, you're going to feel weird. The second one, that's usually like when people bail, they yep. feel like it's way too much and they want to stop whatever you do don't stop you have to get that third one in break. you like break through you go to this other place and i was just like yeah whatever you know i had done mushrooms a, a ton but it, you know this is just a few years ago now that i did dmt for the first time and so i wasn't really expecting it to be that crazy yeah and i had the first hit and i uh, started feeling like I was turning into a cartoon or something. Yep. And then I took the second hit and then the universe just started collapsing around me. What is and that? Can you explain that to me? Yeah, it's like, um, it's like if, if these walls in here just started disassembling like puzzle pieces and unfolding and unlocking. So you're, se- you're physically seeing these, these walls come apart. Yeah. Okay. All right. So and literally collapsing. Yeah. Okay. All right. And so that kind of freaked me out a little <laughs> bit. Yeah. And then, and then the enough. guy that was kind of guiding me through it mm-hmm. saw the kind of panic on my face and he's like, what more? <laughs> and so I filled up the bong and I had the sense of peace wash over me. And then everything, like everything that I've ever seen, everything I've ever known, just goes bump, 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 gone. And it was just <laughs> me in this black, infinite void, and uh, brought the bong with me, fortunately. And I was just so floating. So you're, you're there, hold, you can see you holding the bong. In the yeah, that's, all that I can see is me in this bong, and there's nothing else. I'm just like floating in space. Uh-huh. Like no stars, no planets, nothing. And the smoke inside the bong turned into electricity, and that electricity turned into codes. And I was like, this is going to be weird. Uh-huh. And then I smoked all those codes up, and then I just shot through a tunnel of fractals and lights and insane colors I'd never seen before. 
And then I just landed in a hologram computer chip city that was made out of lights that looked super familiar for some reason. And um, the lights were communicating with me in this way that I understood perfectly somehow, like thoughts without words. And right away, it was just like, welcome, so happy to see you. And I was like, oh shit, I, I broke my brain. You know, like I, I really, I really did it this time. I like whatever the fuck they made me smoke. Now I'm just lost in this weird world and I've gone completely crazy. Yeah. And, uh, and the things like, hey, focus, pay attention. And it starts building these buildings, and it's like, this is how I talk, and, and, uh, and I'm watching it, and it's building these things, and it's like communicating with me, and, and it's like, do you understand? And I'm like, I guess so. And then I was like, no, do you really want to see something? Like, it was going to show me the... I've seen enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, at the time, it was just like, I was just taking everything as is, yeah. but it was it, like, I swore it was going to show me like the meaning of life or something. I'm like, okay. And it like points to this area and I look over and then there's just this weird cartoon cat there just laughing at me. <laughs> and I looked back and it's just like, ah, I'm just fucking with you. And that was it. The trip was over. I was just a hundred percent back to normal, as clear headed as I've ever been in my entire life, going, What the fuck was that? And so yeah, I've smoked DMT a lot of times yeah. since then. I I don't like not knowing how something works, and DMT is like the biggest mystery that I've ever come across. And those that that trip is one of the milder ones that I've ever had. They've only gotten crazier since that time. In Australia, someone would look at you after telling that story and say that you're cooked cunt. That's what they would say. That, I that is don't fried. know what that means, but it sounds correct. Like it, cooked, like fried. Like that is just insane. Like that is yeah. such a cro cooked story. But like. If that's just the 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 bottom of the pile, like, can you go into? That was a great story. That was the, one of the greatest things I've ever heard. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not joking. That just, I just, you can't make that shit up. That happened. I mean, you can Google DMT art and see what people that smoke DMT they make art based on it, and you'll see it's like these weird alien worlds. So from that, then, yeah, let's go real deep. Do the, do, did that world exist? Does that world exist in your head as your imagination or is it another realm? I always thought that it was inside of our heads, mm -hmm. that, it's, that we have this multiverse of perception inside of our heads, mm -hmm. that uh, we have many different consciousnesses inside mm -hmm. of our heads. We all have kind of voices in our heads yep. and we all have these different um, personalities that we take on and different roles that we play in life and all of these roles are presumably stored somewhere in our heads that we're able to access very um, very mm -hmm. easily and I think that uh, I think that they're kind of running themselves through simulations in our minds mm -hmm. all of the time um, thinking of kind of future scenarios um, you know like going back to the the shower thing if you have uh, sometimes you have like a bad idea and then you forget about it and then a month later it pops into your head and now it's the perfect idea but you haven't thought about it once in yeah. that month's time well what happened to that idea um m my thinking is that that idea somewhere in your mind takes on a life of its own yep. and it's kind of run through these various simulations and right. sort of obstacle courses to figure yeah. out what the best solutions are yeah. to the many problems that we face in life. And so that's the way that I've always looked at it. Right. But then I've had some experiences that I just simply can't explain with it just being something that's inside of my head. So at this point in my life, I kind of think that maybe you are, um, through the use of these substances, able to tap into some other dimension that we can't normally perceive. As crazy as that sounds, no, and I, I actually so. never uh, thought that I'd be saying that, but now that I've been doing DMT for enough years, and I've, I've like ran the, I have a science podcast. I've ran my experiences by a bunch of neuroscientists, and like tried to ask around and and figure things out scientifically and I've kind of given up on 
um, figuring things out on a on a basic kind of scientific model because uh, it just doesn't explain a lot of the experiences that I've had. I've seen things and then had other people see the exact same Similar thing things. without me telling them that I had seen them. And are these other entities? Other beings? Are they- yeah. Okay, uh, like like what we've we've had other podcasts about this, like where and the viewers they're totally open to what these may may be different entities, different extraterrestrials sure. of some sort. But sure, the first time that it happened, um, it was probably the twentieth time that I'd smoked DMT. I saw a lot of insane things Mm -hmm. like i saw that this world is a simulation and i saw uh, that this universe is a simulation there's this this uh fabric of uh computation that Mm -hmm. exploded kind of this universe and um an infinite number of other universes into existence and um and was sucked into this pattern and this pattern is underlying everything Mm -hmm. um and uh, and and ju- just like when you dream, you see you might see a room and a bunch of people and all, that, but it's still just one perception. It's still just one yes. th- coming yeah. from one uh, uh, point of view. Point yeah. Uh, yeah, one little area of the brain, and uh, and so it, it's just given the illusion of of you being separate. You mm-hmm. think that the dream's happening to you, but you're creating the dream, and it's all one thing. It's all yeah. the same thing. Yeah. And so something like that is happening in the universe as well. So uh, at least that's, that's what this one particular thing was showing me. And then I saw this, uh, this at the end of like this work day of like figuring out how to keep this portal open. Mm-hmm. I had this, I saw this carnival um, and there's this purple um, dancing like gypsy alien woman um dancing around and when we saw each other it was like oh my god it was i i had never consciously seen her before but as soon as i saw her it was like we had known each other for like yeah. tens of thousands of years yeah and um and we were very excited to see one another and we were like hanging out for a while and then when it started wearing off i had to go away and it was a little sad and and uh, and I told my friends about it afterwards, and I told them that I was like, yeah, it was weird. She was wearing these like she's wrapped in these weird coats, um, like these ropes of coats. And then uh, the next day, I went to a different city and introduced a comic friend of mine who he doesn't know these other people. I didn't, and I didn't want to influence his perception, so I didn't tell people any of my experiences at mm. the time. And I gave DMT to him. He had never done it before. And he, so he did it for the first time and, uh, and he smokes it and he starts freaking out. I told him the first two minutes, all that I told him was that the first two minutes can be really intense. And after that, you kind of settle into it. And, uh, and he starts freaking out and he's like, I had too much. I had too much. I had too much. He keeps on saying that over and over again, like a minute and a half has gone by and he's still just over and over again. I had too much. I had too much. And at this point I'm starting to get a little bit worried. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. And, uh, and then he takes off these headphones. I, I had, I, it's helps to wear, to listen to music a little right. bit. And, uh, he takes off these headphones and he's like, I had too much. I'm like, no, Bob, it's, it's only been like a minute and a half. Uh, you know, you got, you got another 30 seconds and then things should chill out. And then he just like sits back and relaxes and starts smiling. And, uh, and then he goes, oh man, they love you in here. And, uh, and I was like, yeah, there's like this sense of like going home or like yeah. feeling of love. That's, that's very common. Um, when people smoke DMT, they're like, oh, I've been here before. Yeah. That's a very common reaction. And, uh, and I was like, so I was just kind of validating that. And he's like, no, Shane, they love you. And I was like, what? And he's like, there's this purple woman in here that says that she knows you and that she needs you to know that she loves you. And I'm like, Mm. what? What are you talking about? And he goes, I'm in this carnival right now, and there's this purple dancing gypsy woman that says that you come in here a lot and that she knows you really well, and she needs you to know that everything's going to be okay. And, uh, and then I asked him about it afterwards and he said that when he first got in there, he saw all these beings and he freaked out 
and they freaked out and like scurried away and then mm -hmm. they were like peeking at him and that was freaking him out more and then when he took the headphones off and heard my voice they all started popping out and they're like is that shane mm -hmm. and uh and he's like you guys know shane and then all these beings came out and this purple woman came out and started talking with him and then he's like the strangest thing was she is wrapped in these weird codes like these serpentine codes and after that happened, I, I've had a hard time explaining DMT yeah. as just like some, uh, inner, the, yeah, yeah. some inner thing. And I actually found a picture um, of, uh, of a drawing of her one day when I was like looking up physics ideas, yeah. trying to explain what the hell I was seeing in some guy in Turkey um, named Hakim Harum or something like that. Some who Turkish, smokes, yeah smokes DMT and draws what he sees, um, made this painting that's like exactly her. Right. Um, and so other people are seeing these similar entities yeah. as well. Yeah. And so there's, there's something odd going on. Right. Um, that's difficult to explain. <laughs> for yeah. Sure. I don't think, I don't know if we'll ever be able to explain it, but, um, so, I mean, at your point now coming from, Shane, the we we Catholic, we Christian. What, like, where, what was your? I was like? raised Catholic. Okay. Yeah. So Shane, the little Catholic kid, uh, versus you know Shane, the adult man. You know, do, are there aliens? Are there spirits? Are there like? I mean, we have different names for all these things, but I mean, I I feel like there. It's more, it's most probably is than there is than it isn't. I think it's you can't explain there not being it. I mean, from my experiences, I'm now, I went from being like atheist my whole life to yep. now I'm like agnostic. Um, agnostic. I, don't, I don't, know don't know what the hell yes. is going on. Yeah. I'm a little confused by it. Sometimes I think that I should maybe never do another psychedelic again. Yep. Other times I'm like, I think I still need to like keep, I think I have work to do in those worlds because that's what it seems like. Um, it seems like they're uh, they're reaching out. It seems like it seems like networks um, like to kind of build on one another and make bigger networks. So yep. we have this supercomputer inside of our heads, yes, and then um, that's incredibly powerful. But then we also like to reach out and connect with other people, these other supercomputers, yep. and then and then us as a society form this uh, have this collective knowledge that is uh incredible and, yes. and we're able to delegate responsibilities and people are, are able to have these various levels of expertise um as individuals and then when you amass all of those expertise together we we are able to do these incredible things and i think that uh i mean neurons the way that neurons seem to work is is they they seem to just want to connect and I think that we're all just yeah. kind of neurons just trying to connect yeah, yeah. and I think that potentially that there are um, other dimensions that we aren't perceiving which is kind of what most physicists seem to think at this point as well yeah. and there is potentially other life in these other dimensions and and other kind of networks of computation that seem very foreign that are also trying to reach out I mean in this in our in our uh, known galaxy, we are uh, we are putting out uh, humans are putting out quite a bit of processing power compared mm -hmm. to any uh, we can't find anything yeah. else that's putting out yeah. the amount of processing power that that we are. So maybe there is um, maybe there is something that is maybe there's some way of communicating through some level of through some other dimension, some other level of perception that we are just learning, that other entities are just learning, yep. and that we are kind of stumbling across through the use of... Uh, I mean, what, what some of these drugs might be doing is they might be shutting down various regions of the brain that yep. are filtering information in a way that, that allows us to see this, um, this kind of ultimate truth yep. that, 
that, uh, that maybe we were able to perceive easier before our brains got as complicated as, as they are now. Yeah, I was, well, that, I was sort of leading into what I was going to ask is that there's people out there that do say that, you know, when we were first put here, we were, we were operating on higher dimensions anyway and that we were, you know, speaking telepathically and, and that now in today's society where, you know, we're really sort of drained down into this one tiny little slither of visible light and that, you know, we, we like to think this is the only thing that exists, but humans before, I mean, a cat can, and a dog can see more than what we can see. So right. there must have been a point in history where people were uh, able to see more and, and possibly communicate with more. And, and maybe this is where we ha have answers to things like pyramids and all these other crazy, crazy things that have formed what we have today. Um, where do you look at, you know, like, uh, what is it, Atlantis and all these, these ancient civilizations that just go? Were they, were they more technolog technologically advanced in the mind than what we are today? I mean, I think that our consciousness keeps on evolving yep. and changing. And I think that it is a misunderstanding that evolution works like gets better just because something like multiplies and gets better doesn't necessarily mean that it's that it's good sometimes yes. sometimes things just take off by happenstance and and other factors that it doesn't evolution doesn't mean that so it, the idea that our consciousness is evolving doesn't necessarily mean that it's getting better yeah. um and so our consciousness has evolved through i mean i think that language has very much changed the way that we perceive our conscious awareness i think that writing has changed the way that we perceive our yeah. conscious awareness and i think that even um modern advances in technology if you look at uh i mean to like really simplify things i used to know how to I used to have like a decent sense of direction and know how to get around things yeah. and uh, around places. And yeah. now I'm, I'm completely lost without my GPS. I yeah. don't, I don't have a phone. Um, I just got in today and I haven't gotten a prepaid phone yet. And I'm like utterly lost? helpless. Yeah. If I, yeah. I don't, I wouldn't know where to go from here. I'm yeah. completely hopeless. And so I've like, I've completely taken that, what used to be in my conscious awareness. And I've, I've, delegated it outside of my mind right. and and uh, if you look at like the way in which our minds are altered by food by every i mean yep. sugar alters our consciousness so if, yep. if you have a particular candy or soda or whatever that you are particularly fond of when you go into a store you're going to see that very yep. very readily even though that's that's a very small sliver of what's happening in in your visual field. That that one little sticker for whatever brand yeah. is going to stick out to you, and that's yeah. going to be pretty much all that you see compared to everything else. Color is another one. Yeah, you know, you see different colors. Like I know a lot of uh, fast food brands and stuff like that use yellow and red in a lot of their stuff because it emits a certain emotion of some sort. Uh, but sugar is an interesting one. I mean, there's a lot of how do you like with your diet are you quite uh you do you really care what you eat eat or are you, are you, do you, do you get to a point because i've got to a point where i'm like i mean I, i'm like oh what 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 about the fluoride in the water like what about all these different things mcdonald's and, and you know the the you know fake sugar they put in the diet drinks and and all these different things like yeah maybe it's probably me being a tiny bit paranoid we're gonna die anyway but do you think that there is some sort of a agenda at play at some point, whether it be with food, whether it be with television, whether it be with news, politics, whatever, that is pushing our conscious and our, you know, and our vibrational energy to sort of a lower dimension? Do you think that there is an agenda at play to stop us from evolving in some way? At well, mass? I mean, I, I think just from a, a, just, just from a capitalist consumerist perspective i mean if you're if you're selling a product uh, you want to have return customers and mm -hmm. if you have a product that is incredibly addictive mm -hmm. and uh, you yeah. know is is fulfilling um whatever need or whatever pleasure and is doing a really nice job of of uh of 
triggering whatever reward mechanism in the brain yep. and then uh, you're going to sell more of that product and there's going to be a lot of incentive for you to um, kind of uh, neglect maybe some of the negative yep. effects even even if even if you're not trying to do even if you don't think that you're doing this you're still going to be biased toward thinking you know well my pay increases and people are making their own, you're still, your judgment's going to be biased toward thinking that you're doing, uh, you're not doing anything that's in the wrong and, mm. and you're going to be biased toward seeing kind of the statistics that you want and the information yeah. that you want. And you're yeah. going to, I, I think that people find ways to sleep at night um, mm. regardless. And so, uh, and especially if, you know, you're probably just working for one company. So if you're just one company that's uh, screwing people over, who cares when there's like thousands of other companies screwing people mm. over out there? So what are you going to do? Save the world? Of course not. But, you know, you can provide for your family more if, if, you, can, if you can kind of turn a blind eye to what some of these negative effects are. And when you talk about television, I mean... Look at uh, look at the news. If you're if you're someone that's creating news and you're trying to get ratings, yeah, I'm I'm trying to get people into my shows, so yeah. I might be biased too, and I might be saying, "Hey, no, you don't need to worry about psychedelics, and and there's nothing wrong that right. happens with them, and yeah. and they're they're super enlightening, and they'll change your life and yeah. get rid of depression." And I might be biased towards saying that because I'm selling a yeah. particular show, yeah. so I I don't think that it has to do it. It even has to be like that higher level of conspiracy. I think a lot of these things mm. just evolve very naturally, naturally and yeah. I think that there's no way around it. I, I I mean, there's very little way around it. I think that the news is ratings dependent, not truth dependent, yeah, and of I think that um, pharmaceuticals are kind of this same way where every Dependent on sickness as opposed to dependent on everyone being healthy. Yeah, well, every every single pharmaceutical product that goes out there is its own little species that evolves. Yes. And and what what um, uh, and how how many of those? Uh, so if if a pill is like a gene, how many of those pills get dispersed into our culture has yeah. to do with a variety of influences yeah. one big one being money yeah. another one being like can it help people you know but yeah. but sometimes that's not everything sometimes money isn't everything either sometimes there's laws there's regulations in place yeah. there's a lot there's a lot of other factors but definitely the idea that that uh that because a pill is doing really well yeah. that that must mean that it's really healthy Helpful. for yeah, you yeah, yeah. is, is yeah. really far off from yeah. the truth. Okay. Um, I, I guess to end on, on this one, uh, obviously like what's going on in the world, the, I, I don't know. I believe the world's crazier than it's ever been. I mean, we've always been pretty crazy. It's been crazy times. But... Donald Trump as president of the United States yeah. of America. Well, I don't know how much crazier things can possibly be. It's like the whole fucking country is tripping, and <laughs> yeah. and and it's like, and then I went to a psych ward. I'm like, you guys voted for <laughs> Donald Trump. I'm the one going to a psych ward. That's a good point. <coughs> um, I'm more at the point. Where I'm like, fuck it, it's done. All right, this is just fun to watch. We get to watch from afar, even though it does affect us. <laughs> whatever he says, it, it does affect everyone in the world. Yeah. Um, to, to to see it from afar is still great. Uh, until something really bad happens and then we'll go, oh, shit. But I think my question was uh, sort of in relation, not necessarily just in relation to the, the shooting that was in Las Vegas, but just in general with the craziness that's going on in the world. Um, do you feel like uh, psychedelics and, and things like that could have a positive effect at mass to people if people were to embrace it a little more do you feel like there is a possibility that those things could heal us a little more so that this crazy crap that's going on right now is just flicked back a switch absolutely i mean i don't 
I'm I'm not one that's usually like everyone should do psychedelics. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I think that the world <laughs> would benefit from yeah. um, from if if um, if we could go back to how psychedelics started in our modern society, which is in a therapeutic setting mm -hmm. where you go into a therapist's office and do LSD or psilocybin yeah. or whatever, <coughs> I think that would be amazing. And I mean, if you look at um, what is kind of ruining a lot of people's drug addiction and uh, psychedelics are one of the best cures for drug addiction that yeah. I can think of. I mean, um, I've, I've had problems with alcohol, uh, much of my life and, uh, smoking cigarettes and that sort of thing. And the only thing that's ever been able to stop my addiction has been psychedelics and they've worked quite well for that. Yeah. And, um, and if you look at the kind of things that, that got someone like Donald Trump uh, elected, it's, uh, the things that all, the, all these people are scared of with like, um, you know, these bad hombres and terrorists yeah. and, 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 the, and the inner city violence. Well, if you look at what, if you try to look for like a little bit of truth in all of that, it's, if you look at the cartels and the terrorists, which even though statistically they're not that big of a deal, but they are yeah. still causing fear and madness in people. And then yeah. if you look at the gangs in the inner city in the, in the U.S., What's funding all of them is illegal drugs. Yeah. So if yeah. you were to end prohibition, they would lose all of their funding immediately. Yeah. And now you don't have mm -hmm. gangs, you don't have cartels, you don't have terror cells because they simply have no money. But then that, that, if they get rid of that, that feeds into our businesses or you know, government business and policing and prisons and all that. So it's, it's almost like a necessary evil to keep this thing operating like with war and the money like to keep this monetary system afloat it's it's yeah. like we need to have the good with the bad and uh, you know I, I just don't know how we solve it <laughs> it's unsolvable yeah. we're fucked we're it, fucked it's possible that we're fucked <laughs> yeah but we're also uh, we're also <laughs> learning um quite a bit i mean yeah. We, we're yeah we're learning a lot about uh neuroscience and psychology and sociology and and although some of the things that we're learning, um, you know, are used for like corporate greed or, yeah. uh, uh, you know, or authoritarian regimes or whatever yeah. it might be, I think that a lot of, uh, I mean, I, I interview scientists all the time, and I don't think that uh, I think that all of them are all the ones that I've talked to are seemingly just kind of curious people that are trying to inform yeah. our society yeah. more so yeah i think people might eventually wise up and just start reading more that would be amazing i think that is happening yeah. truly I, th I think i think it is happening yeah um you know and if you can tour a a comedy show about psychedelics across what was 116 111 111 cities, cities in, the US, yeah. in the u.s and and bring it here and and people want to come out and see that stuff and, and embrace it uh, and not look at it like this is some crazy shit uh, and you know have an open mind with everything um, it's almost like information is the best thing that we have right now and it's also our biggest enemy because there's there's probably an information war going on as well yeah that sounded like Alex Jones shit but anyway uh, yeah yeah I mean possibly the truth is diluted in, in all the shit that's on Google but Shane best of luck with the shows across Thank Australia you very much. Uh, thanks, thanks for, thanks for coming me. back and uh I guess we'll hopefully see you sometime in the future and yeah. uh, not in the psych ward. <laughs> yeah. All right, awesome, mate, man. take care. Thanks for watching. Thank you.